It is my pleasure to be able to introduce to you Rabbi Dr. Lindsay Taylor Gerdhart, who's going to be teaching us a nine week course titled Cousins, a Jewish introduction to Islam. Rabbi Dr. Lindsay, the floor is yours. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. That's a very, a very kind and flattering introduction. I hope I live up to it. So, um, yes, we're going to be looking at different aspects of Islam. Um, what I usually do is I pause at various places in case people have any questions and please feel free. It's probably easiest to put them in the chat because then I can see if people have asked the same thing twice. Um, so maybe deal with them in groups. So do feel free, please, to put uh, any questions you have as we're going on, and I'll try and pause and catch up on those questions as we go. So the first thing we need to say is to acknowledge the difficulty of learning about other religions and the baggage that we come with, the legacy of history. Uh, we have sometimes seen Muslims and Jews coexisting, uh, notably in what's often called the Golden Age of Spain, but we have seen those communities at loggerheads and particularly in the modern Middle East. Uh, there are things like media distortions, there are our own stereotypes to deal with, and it can be a little challenging to breaking out of this sort of relationship with other religions, including our very natural tendency to regard those other religions as monolithic and unchanging, which is something that we know is not true about Judaism, but it's very easy for us to assume that about other religions, especially if we don't know much about them. So there are some basic uh, if you like, rules of engagement that I suggest we, uh, we look at or adopt, and here they are. First of all, to avoid disputation, we don't have to assume that everything the other religion says is denied by our own, uh, or assume it's a win-lose situation. Avoiding proselytization, we don't learn about other religions in order to encourage conversion, either way. Uh, avoiding syncretism. We don't try and sort of squidge all the different religions together and pretend there's one sort of great religion that encompasses everything um, or some meaningful blend of them. Uh, we should avoid relativism. We don't have to say that there is no ultimate truth. You can go on believing in our own religion's truth claims uh, while still respecting the other religion, but we don't have to give up those truth claims. Uh, we also don't have to say that all religious truth is relative. And lastly, we should try and avoid triumphalism. We don't have to assume that we have a complete monopoly on truth, and that Islam just stole bits and pieces from Judaism, Christianity, and formed them into a new religion. And we don't have to assume that history will prove us right in the end, because let's face it, none of us know the end of the story, not from where we are uh, in our position in history. So those are just useful things to remember. And I also want to uh, just read this passage from Reuben Fastone, who wrote an excellent book called an, Isla uh, an Introduction to Islam for Jews that I highly recommend. And he writes very perceptively, one of the reasons that religionists tend to think negatively of other religions is that they employ different methods for judging their own religion that they use to judge the religion of the other. Jews and Judaism have often been victimized by this problem over the ages as the ignorant or enemies try to prove that Judaism is a primitive or even evil religion. The simplest way this false comparison is made is to compare the best of one religion with the worst of another. One can do this with a variety of topics, but one particularly relevant topic today is war and peace. If one compares the peaceful verses of the Torah with the militant verses of the Quran, one will evaluate the two quite differently than if one compares the militant verses of the Torah with the peaceful verses of the Quran. It's important to compare fairly, not to compare in order to score points. So I'm just doing this preamble because this does sometimes come up um, and sometimes people do feel a little bit defensive or that you know, they're wrong, we're right or, or whatever. But so it's just good to be aware of these tendencies within ourselves and to try and be as fair as we can. Okay. So we're going to look in this session about the beginnings of Islam. We'll get about just over halfway through the life of Muhammad. And it's important to say, first of all, that even more than with Christianity, for instance, we are totally reliant on Muslim sources for the history of the origins of Islam and the life of Muhammad. We don't have any evidence from 
from outside Arabia as to what was going on within Arabia, certainly uh, anything that mentions Muhammad or the beginnings of Islam at that time. There's very little even from Arabia about anything of that time. So the first and most obvious source is the Quran itself, the sacred book of Islam. So just to give you a very quick introduction to the Quran, and we'll come back and do a whole session on the Quran later on. Uh, it is written in Arabic. It consists of 114 surahs or chapters. A surah is very cognate to the Hebrew word surah, a shape or a form. Uh, and each of those surahs is made up of verses. Uh, They're called ayat in the singular ayah, and that is cognate to the Hebrew word ot, otiot, signs. It is, however, very different from both Jewish and Christian sacred scriptures because it doesn't tell you stories, or occasionally stories come up, but they tend to be summaries of stories and not blow-by-blow -blow accounts. And the Quran is not arranged chronologically. It wanders backwards and forwards and round and round um, in a manner much more reminiscent of the Talmud, actually. Muslims believe it was revealed to Muhammad bit by bit uh, between the years 610 and 632 CE. Uh, Muslims also believe it was collected after Muhammad's death and that the text was standardized by a later leader, the Caliph Uthman. And uh, you hear talk of the Uthmanic recension. Uh, there is some academic doubting of this, but that is certainly what Muslims uh, believe. And the earliest surviving manuscripts of the Quran date from before 750 CE. They were recently found in Yemen, and they're slightly controversial because there were one or two differences here or there. And the earliest quotations from the Quran anywhere in the entire world, amazingly, are on Dome of the Rock, which dates from 690. So as uh, Muhammad himself died in 632, that's pretty early on uh, for a quotation of the Quran. So the problem with the Quran as the source of early Muslim history is it doesn't tell you the story. It doesn't tell you what happened. Um, various chapters of the Quran are identified by later tradition as having been recited or given to Muhammad at particular occasions, and the story context is fleshed out in later works. But the Quran itself doesn't tell you. It only mentions Muhammad himself four times in the entire document, and it's just not very interested in his life story. So even for the most traditional of Muslims, you can't use the Quran as a source for what happened early on in Islam. So where do all the ideas about that, where do the information we do have about that, where does it come from? It comes from one particular book, Ibn Ishaq's Sirat Rasul Allah, the life of the messenger of God, which dates from the mid 8th century. So if Muhammad dies in 632, this is well over 100 years after he dies. And this, uh, we know there were other biographies of Muhammad, but they haven't survived. But or, or the, the ones that the contemporary haven't survived, there are later ones that are based on um, the Ibn Ishaq's book. So it's the, the, the fountainhead of all later um, ideas about what happened in the early years of Islam. Uh, however, we don't have the original version. We have a much later version uh, that was edited by somebody called Ibn Hisham, who tells us he edited the original version. And we don't have what Ibn Ishaq actually wrote. So we have a version of a version that was written down about 100 years, 150 years after Muhammad died. Uh, what Ibn Ishaq, the original author, used was oral material, hadiths. Uh, traditions that were passed down, and Islam has a huge science of hadiths. Uh, it records not only the content of the tradition, but exactly who passed it down. Now, in Jewish literature, we have this to some extent. We might have Rav said, that Rav Yossi said, that something or other. In Islam, it'll go all the way back to the person who saw the Prophet Muhammad do something. So they have these long chains of tradition, they're called an isnad, a chain, and then you have the content of what that tradition was. And I've brought one for you here, so you can see what this uh, biography, this edited biography of Muhammad looks like. So here, the way I've written one, this is the chain. Ibn Shibab al-Zuhri told me, I, the author of the book, Ibn Ishaq, from Ubaid ibn Abdallah, he learned it from this man, it was, it was Ibn Utba, who learned, her son of Uba, Utba, who learned it from Aisha, the prophet's favorite wife. So this is a three-link chain from Aisha to Ubaid ibn Abdallah ibn Utbah to Ibn Shihb al-Zuhri, and then it was recorded by Ibn Ishaq. And what is the actual content, what's called the mutton, or the content of the tradition, that she used to hear the apostle, that Muhammad, say, 
God never takes a prophet to himself without giving him the choice, either choice of whether to die or not. When he, when Muhammad was at the point of death, the last word I heard the apostle saying was, nay, rather the exalted companion of paradise. I said to myself, then by God, he is not choosing us. In other words, she feels she heard the response by Muhammad to God's question, would you rather come to me in paradise or would you rather stay here? And he's chosen to go to paradise. And I knew that that was what he used to tell us, namely that a prophet does not die without being given the choice. And that's not a particularly um, historical point, uh, you, you could say. Uh, it tells you something about uh, a conception of prophecy in relationship with God. But there are also hadiths about actual actions in Muhammad's life. And these were used to flesh out an entire biography. It's not what you would call um, a historical narrative. It's a chain of traditions that have been worked together into a story. But this is where uh, all our information comes from. As to its, its actual absolute historical value, we honestly don't know because this is basically what we've got. So the Quran is not much of a source for what happened. Uh, Ibn Ishaq's uh, Sirah or life uh, is the best we've got, but again, it's later than the events it portrays. And it, may, it probably wasn't designed as a history, it was designed as, as um, a description of somebody who was believed to be a prophet. And our third source, which is most indirect, is our knowledge of what was going on at the time in Arabia and the Near East. And that's important for seeing the context of the development of Islam. So we need to look at a map, which is. And you can see that the region was principally divided between two great empires, the Byzantine Empire, which is basically the late Roman Empire. And by this point, it was Christian. And the Persian Empire, which was being ruled by the Sassanid dynasty. And the main religion, the official religion there was Zoroastrianism, which is still around. Um, the Parsis of India are Zoroastrians, and there are some Zoroastrians in Iran still. And uh, these are the major influences at the time. And Zoroastrianism was a, a dualistic religion. It had a good god, Ahura Mazda, and an evil force, Ahriman, who were understood as locked in eternal combat. And uh, it was all about light overcoming dark, or dark attempting to overcome light. So uh, again, uh, this, by the way, that this is exactly the period when the Babylonian Talmud is being written, and we see in the Talmud traces of fighting against this dualistic view of things, and uh, our rabbi is saying, no, don't adopt these Zoroastrian ideas. So, so uh, we were reacting against Zoroastrianism at this time. If we look closely at what was going on, just to summarize it, late Rome, or the Byzantine Empire, was Christian, was, uh, Orthodox Christianity, if you like, mainstream Christianity at the time. Lots of languages are being spoken, Greek in the East, Latin in the West, also Syriac, Aramaic, Arabic, and Coptic, which is the ancient language of Egypt. There were lots of minor religions or heresies, as they were called by the ruling church, Monophysite Christians, Nestorian Christians, Coptic Monophysites, another form of Christians, lots of Christian groups and heresies, and Jews, who were the only other permitted religion in the empire. I won't get into why, but it's interesting. Uh, what was happening at the time? The big church councils, uh, which laid down a very fundamental rules that have uh, shaped Christianity ever since. Uh, intense discussion of the nature of Jesus. Was he a person? Was he a God? Was he a bit of both, etc. The worship of saints and relics was becoming very prominent, and there was political tension with the Persian Empire. What was going on in Sasanian Persia? We said Zoroastrianism so is the religion. Again, a variety of languages, Aramaic, which is what our ancestors who were living there were speaking, Persian, Arabic, Armenian, Kurdish, and various others. And they also had lots of religions who were minorities. Again, Nestorian Christians, Monophysite Christians, Jews, uh, Manichaeans, Manichaeanism is another religion, uh, Buddhists, Hindus, and Mazdakites. Again, uh, Manichaeanism and Mazdakites have, have died out. What was going on? There was tension between Christians and Zoroastrians. As we said, the Babylonian Talmud was being composed during these centuries. And Manichaeism really took off and it spread as far as China and was for a while an absolutely huge religion. So it didn't last. So religiously speaking, there was a lot going on there. A lot of influence, a lot of thought and 
cross-fertilization of ideas and people of different languages and different religions were interacting with each other a lot. We can also see on this map two Arab tribes that were set up as proxy states by the great powers. So the monophysite Christian tribe of the Banu Hassan or the Hassanids, who were influenced by the Byzantines and served as their sort of frontier guard, and the Banu Lachm or the Lachmids, who were cli a client state of the Persian Empire. I think they probably were just practicing local Arabian pagan religion. I don't think they were Zoroastrian. So who was actually living down here? Nomadic Bedouin, town dwellers, and there were a lot of merchants. There were also Jewish communities and Christian communities in the Arabian Peninsula, which we don't do an awful lot about. Um, generally, the settled towns tended to be on the coast, and the more uh, the more mobile and nomadic tribes were in the very deserty interior. And we can see there was again a lot going on here. Sometimes Christians who were regarded as heretics in the Byzantine Empire escaped to Arabia because they would be safe there. Uh, and we do know that there were quite a lot of Jews there. We don't know if they were Jews who had moved in from the land of Israel, not so far away, or whether they were locals who had become Jewish in some way or other, or maybe a mixture, we just don't know. We're also very unsure about what exact form of Judaism they practiced, but people tend to think it probably wasn't close to what we would regard as normative Judaism. And that may be the reason for some slightly surprising assertions about what Jews believe in the Quran itself. So for instance, we have this rather startling statement, the Jews say that Uzair is the son of God, and the Christians say that the Messiah is the son of God. Well, that, pu that uh, puzzles Jews no end, because I'm just, I can hear you all saying, who's Uzair? And we really don't know, but there is a theory, it's Ezra. And some late Jewish apocalyptic writing does actually assign a near divine or angelic status to both Ezra and Enoch, another figure from the Bible. So maybe this is a reflection of a non-normative belief that was held by some Arabian Jews. We just don't know. Otherwise, it's very puzzling to think, well, what is this, you know, what is being talked about here? But we know the local Jews were very like the people around them. They were organized in tribes, as everybody else was in Arabia. And uh, so the tribes and clans, just like their Arab neighbors. And there was a Jewish kingdom in the south that you may never have heard of, but it actually existed. Uh, and it, it appears in various places, including Ibn Ishaq's biography of the Prophet Muhammad. And he preserves a tradition about its foundation. He says that an Arab tribal leader named Abu Karib Assad, who lived in the fourth to fifth century, uh, from the southern tribe of Himya went off to the town of Yathrib, now Medina, to conquer it, but instead converted to Judaism after meeting some Jews who were living there. And we certainly know that in the time of Muhammad, there were Jews living there. So when this leader, Abu Karib, went back to his own area, this is what uh, Ibn Ishaq says happened, his countrymen, the Himyarites, blocked his path, saying, you will not enter Yemen because you left your religion. Then he invited them to his religion, I, Judaism. So they said, let's test it by the fire. He agreed. There was a custom in the Yemen that a fire would judge between them when they had their differences. It would consume the guilty and let the innocent go unharmed. So the Himyarites went forth with their idols and their religious objects, and the two Jewish leaders came forth with their sacred texts hanging like necklaces from their necks. Is this a reference to tefillin? Not clear. They stopped where the fire would blaze out. When it blazed forth, the Himyarites were terrified and withdrew, but their comrades held them back and commanded them to be patient. So they held their ground until the fire consumed their idols, their offerings, and those who carried them. The two Jewish leaders then came out with their scripts hanging from their necks, they have possible to fill them, we don't know, their foreheads sweating, but otherwise unharmed. So the Himyarites took on his religion from then on, and this is the origin of Judaism in the Yemen. Now, it's not clear how historical that is or not, but it certainly is uh, evidence that Ibn Ishaq felt that the presence of a Jewish kingdom in the Yemen needed to be accounted for. And Abu Karib, the original uh, Jewish king, his son, Yusuf, uh, became a great warrior, and he ruled Yemen for about 38 years in the mid-6th century. He repelled an invasion of Christian Ethiopians. Uh, he also massacred the Christian inhabitants of the town of Najran, which is an event that was recorded by Christians, so it definitely happened. Um, we tend um, to downplay things like that, but it happened. 
And eventually, uh, Yusuf was killed by the Ethiopian invaders, and that was the end of the Jewish kingdom of Kimya. And of course, there is a question about how much of this survived in the later Jewish community that we know in Yemen. Were they descendants of the Himyarites, you know, or, or had they been influenced? We, we simply don't know. As well as these Jewish influences in Arabia, we also know there were local Christians, as I mentioned, and also, interestingly, there were local Arab monotheists, and they are described in the Quran by the word Hanif, which just means um, a monotheist. Uh, the word is also used to describe Abraham. And during Muhammad's lifetime, there was another monotheistic prophet called Musalima in a region known as Yamama, which is north of Yemen. And like Muhammad, he claimed to have received a revelation from God, and he even offered to Muhammad to share that prophetic mission, but Muhammad refused and said he was a, a false prophet. Uh, so that's interesting that there are other people around at the same time who believe in one God. So Muhammad isn't the only one. There are other people in Arabia at this time. Now, the picture of pre-Islamic Arabia that you find in most standard Muslim uh, sources is much, much darker. And the period before Islam is described as the Jahiliya, the ignorance period. And it's described as characterized by crude idolatry and barbaric practices like killing off female babies. And the stark contrast between the dark ignorance of Jahiliya and the enlightenment of Islam is still to this day very much uh, something that's promoted in traditional Islamic thought. You know, it was all terrible before, and then Muhammad came along and released us from this awfulness. Uh, we don't actually know how awful local uh, Arabian religion was. Uh, we know that society was very split. It was tribally organized. So whether you were a town dweller or a nomad, uh, your tribe came first. Um, because there weren't very many resources, we know that the nomads used to raid the towns and they would raid trading caravans. And as long as you weren't related, uh, you, you, could, you, know, you would have a go at other groups, basically. And there was constant, constant raiding and feuding. And that was the environment in which Islam emerged. Uh, it wasn't anarchy because everybody knew the rules and played by them. Uh, it was sort of you know, kinship groups against kinship groups. But it was a system that made for constant, constant feuding and a lot of shifting alliances between one group and the next. And one of the reasons that Islam success, that was so successful is that it had provided a way to get past this endless feuding and unite everyone into a much larger society. And that is probably one of the political reasons why Islam did very well. So I'm going to pause just here in case anyone's got any questions. Um, I'm going to stop the share because I can't see the chat. Let's see if there's anything in the chat. No, nope, there isn't. Okay, fine, we will go on. Okay, so now we get to Muhammad himself. And again, having looked at the sources that are available to us and what was happening in the area at the time, we will now turn to the traditional story of the foundation of Islam. Uh, because, as I said, we don't have any external sources, we are completely reliant on Muslim sources, uh, very much as we are for things like the Exodus. We don't have external accounts of the Exodus. So this isn't a great hindrance to people within the religion. Uh, we are ourselves very used to accepting the faith version of our story and maybe discounting academic versions. You probably know uh, biblical criticism and, and uh, various academic approaches like that have questioned the historicity of things like the Exodus and have suggested that the Torah was written much later, maybe from composite documents. And again, within the Jewish community, there are many people who would just go, well, that's wrong. You know, the Torah was given by God to Moses on Sinai, and, that, and that's, that's what happened. So for Muslims, it's rather like that. The traditional version is, that, well, that's what happened. And academic or uh, outside approaches that might question the historicity of some of the story are just irrelevant. They don't, they don't really attract much attention generally, or if anything, of opposition. So it's quite important to distinguish between when we're looking at a faith account and when we're looking at an outside faith account. So we're now, having looked at what we know of the outside the faith account, which is not much, we're now going to go back to the faith account and see what is the account that Islam itself provides of its origins based on, as we saw a tiny bit of the Quran, mostly Ibn Ishaq's collected traditions so um, it's important to note that Muslims don't see Muhammad as an innovator or as the founder of a new religion. For them, there was always the religion of God, the, the, the pure monotheism, and that was followed by Adam and Noah and all the prophets. But over time, it had become corrupt and been overlaid by idolatry and all its associated evils. So they see Muhammad as coming to renew 
clean up and re-proclaim this original true religion. And this is why they see him as the last in this whole chain of prophets that include many people we know from the Tanakh, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, David, uh, also from the New Testament, John the Baptist and Jesus, and some local Arabian prophets that nobody knows anything about because we only know about them from the Quran. There's one called Hud, for instance, uh, who doesn't appear anywhere else. And you can see this reflected in this quote from the Quran, as it's in the second chapter. Say, we believe in God and in what was brought down to us and what was brought down to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes, that's the tribes of Israel, and what was given to Moses and Jesus and what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We do not distinguish between any of them. We are submitters to him, i.e. to God. And this brings up a question about the word Muslim, which means somebody who submits. Uh, most people today would understand it as adherents of Islam. But there is some thought also that a Muslim is somebody who submits to God, and that could include any monotheist. So uh, technically speaking, under that interpretation, Jews and Christians, ignoring the problem of Trinity for the moment, will also be conceived of as Muslimun, people who submit to God's authority. Uh, again, that might be a little bit contested. Uh, not everyone understands that word in the same way. Certainly within the Quran, it sometimes makes more sense to understand it as a general word, meaning people who submit to God rather than adherents or followers of Muhammad. It varies a little bit. Uh, and we said again in with this idea that there's this previous tradition that Muhammad is the last prophet of that chain of prophets. Uh, this also goes with previous scriptures, which are regarded as also God-given. And here is, um, here is this chain of revelations. God brought down the book to in truth, verifying what was before it. God brought down the Torah, which is Taurat in Arabic, and the gospel, the Injil, that comes from Evangelion in Greek. Before is a guide to humanity, and he brought down the Furkan. Furkan literally means something like criterion or way that you tell the truth. Some Muslims understand this to mean the Quran. Other people understand it to mean the rational principles by which you discern what is true. Those who deny the signs of God will have a terrible punishment. God is almighty, able to accept revenge. So, uh, technically, Islam recognizes previous scriptures, uh, monotheistic scriptures, as valid. Now, that may not work out always in practice because there is also, uh, I wouldn't say universal, but there is a tendency among some Muslims to say, yes, well, the original Torah is perfect, but you messed with it. Uh, and the same with the, the gospel. Uh, again, not all Muslims believe that the Torah as we have it now has been messed with, but there are some who do. So you should be aware of that if that comes up. OK, I see there is a question in the chat, so I'll just look at that. Uh, how to explain so many archaeological finds in Israel that corroborate some of our past and other time more comments much later, more modern time, more modern techniques. Find this very curious. Um, well, not really, because um, the archaeological finds in Israel really only work from about the eighth century onwards. And before that, you know, there, there's very, very little archaeological evidence and much of it very questionable and very, very subject to the interpretations that are put on it. So we can't go all the way back. There isn't absolutely no archaeological evidence of the Exodus. I'm terribly sorry to say, but, uh, you know, we don't have it. Um, also, the land of Israel has been intensive, uh, intensively uh, excavated and examined from the 19th century onward. Not very much archaeology has been done in Saudi Arabia. There's some, especially down the south, but, uh, you know, I should think something like 5% of the number of digs that have been undertaken in Israel have been undertaken in Saudi Arabia. So uh, it's very difficult to know if there is archaeological stuff there that might actually clarify things. And as always with any holy site, if you really want to dig them up to find their prehistory, you can't dig them up because they're a holy site. Uh, so you know nobody's going to dig up the Kaaba, like nobody's going to really try digging up the Temple Mount either. But uh, so it's... Um, Again, we need to distinguish between the outside view and the faith view. Muslims would take it quite badly if you said, well, I just think Islam is, is Muhammad's sort of mishearing of Jewish traditions and vast amounts of the Midrash appear in Quran, which is true. Um, as we might not take it very kindly if somebody said, well, you know, I think the Code of Hammurabi probably shaped the Torah and obviously four people at the very, very least, if not more, composed the Torah in the sixth century and, you know, the, the experts is a myth. Uh, again, you need to be a bit sensitive. Uh, you can keep your own opinion, but it's important to distinguish between the inside the faith view 
and whatever your view is as a non-member of that faith. Um, you know, again, remember what we said about it. it's not a zero-sum game. Okay. And ultimately, you know, archaeology is fallible. And uh, I say that as somebody who did two degrees in archaeology. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, we'll look now at this traditional life of Muhammad that's preserved by Ibn Ishaq. So according to his account, Muhammad was born in Mecca in 570 CE into the clan of Hashim. Uh, if you've ever wondered why the Hashemite monarchy of Jordan is so called, it's because they descend from the same clan. And the clan of Hashim was part of a larger tribe called Quraysh. Uh, he had a uh, large uh, tribe in control of Mecca who also did a lot of trading outside Mecca. And Mecca was known already as a holy site because the, uh, the shrine that is now the center of Islam, the Kaaba, was already there pre-Muhammad. It was an ancient black stone house. Even back then it was known as the Kaaba. At that time it contained idols and it stood within a holy area, the Haram, a word that's related to the Hebrew Heren. And it was the focus of local pilgrimage rites. And the Quraysh tribe dominated the town and they derived their income both from the pilgrims, as people always do, and from trading. So Muhammad's father Abdallah died just before he was born. And his mother Amina died when he was six. So he grew up as an orphan under the protection of his uncle Abu Talib. He worked as a shepherd. He also went on some of the local trading caravans and academics. Again, this is the outside faith who have suggested he might have picked up a lot of information from Jews and Christians on trading expedition, expeditions up to Syria. Um, uh, Muslims would say, no. <laughs> so again, it depends which focus you're, you're giving this. Uh, he eventually came to the notice of a wealthy widow called Khadija, who married him. She was very impressed by him. He seems to have been very troubled by the injustices of his society, and he would regularly retreat to a nearby cave on Mount Hira to meditate. And in the year 610, when he was 40 years old, again, 40, very important number in the Bible, uh, on the 27th of the month Ramadan, he was confronted by a heavenly being. And again, later tradition identifies this as the angel Gabriel or Jibril in Arabic, who commanded him Ikra which means recite or read, and is exactly cognate with the Hebrew root kuf, resh, ayin, like kri'a, likro, uh, which can also mean to recite as well as to read, to call out. And Muhammad answers this being that he cannot recite or read, but the command came again and then a third time. And then uh, tradition says the first uh, element of the Quran was revealed to him. And this is it. It's uh, now chapter 96. As, as I said, the Quran is not chronological. Recite, Ikra, in the name of your Lord who created, created the human from a clot. Recite, your Lord is all giving, who taught by the pen, taught the human what he did not know before. So Muhammad went home already doubting his experience. Um, this sounded very like a poem. There are, we have pre-Islamic poetry in Arabic. It was preserved and, and later written down. And it actually is uh, this uh, chapter of the Quran is very much in the form of that early poetry known as Saj. We'll discuss when we go further into the Quran, we'll discuss the resemblance between parts of the Quran and this early poetry. Uh, so Muhammad wasn't too sure this really was the word of God, but his wife Khadija and her cousin Waraka, who was a Christian, uh, believed that he had encountered an angel. And uh, Muhammad was a bit worried he was possessed by a demon and that the tradition records he then got a second revelation to reassure him on this. This is the second revelation by the pen and what they write, you are not, by God's favor, possessed. In fact, you have an endless reward and a powerful inner strength. And then there was a period of silence, and then he had a third revelation, which is the entirety of chapter 93 of the Quran. By the morning hours, by the night when it is still, your Lord has not abandoned you and does not hate you. What is after will be better than what came before. To you, the Lord will be giving you will be content. Did he not find you orphan and give you shelter, find you lost and guide you, find you in hunger and provide for you? As for the orphan, do not oppress him, and one who asks, do not turn him away, and the grace of your Lord proclaim. So at this point, this is sort of his permission, if you like, as prophet, he begins teaching uh, his message of ethical monotheism. He announces that there's one God, that only that God should be worshipped, that God demands justice and ethical behavior from all humans. Uh, 
And as we said before, he also preached that uh, God had sent previous prophets and revelations, uh, but they were generally ignored by humans, or all the, all the humans persecuted these prophets. And now, said Muhammad, God was once again calling people to him and warning them of a final day of judgment, the Yawm Adin, which of course is almost exactly the same as Yom Hadin. Uh, all then would be judged by their actions, and the writers would enjoy the delights of the garden of Janna or Jannat al Adn, Gan Eden, and the wicked would be punished in hell, Jahannam, which is clearly from Ge Bet Pinom, the valley of Bet Pinom. And as Muhammad's followers grew, the establishment figures of the tribe of Quraysh began to see him as a threat. Uh, for a start, these new ideas were going to mess up the pilgrim business, which they relied on very much for their wealth. And for a while, Muhammad was protected by the tribal code that said you could not harm a kinsman. And he also had the protection of his uncle, Abu Talib, and the Hashim clan. But he and his followers were ridiculed, and some of them did experience physical attacks. Uh, some of his followers even ran away to Ethiopia because they didn't feel safe anymore. And in the year 619, so nine years after he's commissioned as a prophet, his enemies declared a boycott against him. And also his wife Khadija and his uncle Abu Talib both died that year. So he is, his position was much, much more precarious. And it was quite clear that um, things were going to get a lot more hairy at this point. So, um, sorry, I was just back. No, so there, that's fine, yep. At this critical point, a delegation turned up from that town we mentioned before, Yathrib. Uh, it's now known as Medina which is an abbreviation of Marinata Nabi, the city of the prophet. And Yathri was in an oasis and settled by several tribes, including several Jewish tribes, interestingly. And two of the tribes, I think not the Jewish ones, were engaged in a major, major feud, a very destructive blood feud with people being killed on both sides. And the inhabitants of Yathri asked Muhammad to come and sort this out, because obviously he had a reputation as somebody who was a peacemaker and an arbiter. And after a couple of years, as the situation in, in uh, Mecca got worse and worse, uh, Muhammad agreed, and he moved to the city of Yathrib in the year 622. And this is an event known as the Hijra, or the Migration. And it's seen as a turning point in Muhammad's life, and it's used as the basic date for the Muslim system of counting years, which, in case you didn't know, is called Anu Hegirai in Latin, the year of the Hijra, or AH, as opposed to AD, Anu Domini. And it's used as a base date for the Muslim system, as we said, so we are now in the year 1444, in case you were wondering. Oh, let me just see, there's a chat question there. Uh, I've told the town Medina was named because of the population. No, it, uh, Medina in Arabic just means city, not state as it does in Hebrew. So Medina and Nabi means city of the prophet, and that's why the name was changed from Yathrib. I have no idea what Yathrib meant, if it meant anything at all. Okay. It wasn't particularly big by our standards. Uh, it would be a major uh, town of, of ancient Arabia, but you're talking uh, hundreds, maybe a couple of thousands, nothing that we'd recognize so, now. So you, had nothing, so you had nothing to do with uh, with the Hebrew word Medina. It's just, it's the same word in Arabic pretty much, and that's why. It's, it's the same uh, root. It, it's the same uh, root. And it means state in Hebrew, but you know, we, we get this a lot, like lachum is the same, uh, means um, meat in Arabic and bread in Hebrew. Uh, so, you, because they have cognate languages, they have roots that sometimes go in, that start out the same, go in slightly different uh, uh, different directions. Yeah. Sounds good. So yeah. it is related to Hebrew, but it's got a different. It's meaning. not, but it's not. It's not because the Jewish community named that city or something. It's <laughs> very much got <laughs> standard that... words to say for town in Arabic. If you if you do Arabic one hundred and one, one of the first words you'll learn is Madina, mm. a useful word. Okay, so in Yathrib, or modern Medina, Muhammad managed to bring peace to the warring factions. Uh, he reformed the idea of social responsibility, and he for the first time started creating a social unit that was bigger than the tribe, which was a heck of an innovation in Arabia at that time. And this change is embodied in a document known as the Pact of Medina, or the Constitution of Medina, Dustur al Medina. Uh, it constituted a formal agreement between Muhammad and all the various important tribes and families of Yathrib, and they included his Muslim followers, we'll call them Muslim because that's what they are beginning to be known as, the Jews and the pagans. They were to form a single unit, an ummah, which is cognate to the Hebrew ummah. Uh, ummah means community, just as ummah uh, in Hebrew means a nation, like ummah the nations of the world. Again, that's a really close route. 
uh, a community or a confederation perhaps, and they were to unite against outside enemies. Now we have this preserved again by Ibn Ishaq. We don't have any original copies. So again, we're taking it on trust that something like this is what it was. So let's have a look at that. This is a document from Muhammad the Prophet governing the relations between the believers and Muslims of Quraysh and Yathrib. Quraysh is the tribe from Mecca, and Yathrib is the local people and those who followed them and joined them and labored with them. They are one community, one ummah, to the exclusion of all men. The Quraysh emigrants, the people who left Mecca, according to their present custom, shall pay the blood for payment within their number. That's if somebody gets killed, um, the, the relations of the killer have to pay a blood fine. That was absolutely standard in contemporary society. And they shall redeem their prisoners with the kindness and justice com common above believers. In other words, somebody raids you, you buy back your prisoners. That's what you do for your group. The Banu Auf, another tribe, according to their present custom, shall pay the blood payment they paid in the Jahiliya in the pre-Islamic period. Every section shall redeem its prisoners with the kindness and justice common among the believers. The Banu Sada, the Banu Qari, the Banu Jusham, the Banu Najan, likewise all different tribes living in Medina. The God-fearing believers shall be against the rebellious or him who seeks to spread injustice or sin or enmity or corruption between believers. The hand of every man shall be against him, even if he be a son of one of them. So people who are messing around with the community from inside are punishable. God's protection, zimma, it's an important word we'll come back to, is one. The least of them may give protection to a stranger on their behalf. So there is this a custom again in pre-Islamic Arabia where you can extend your tribe's protection to a client, to somebody who, with whom you have some sort of relationship, and then you avenge them as though they are a, a, a relation. So that deters people from attacking them. Uh, I've missed that bit because it's long. To the Jew who follows us belong health and equality. He shall not be wronged, nor shall his enemies be aided. The peace of the believers is indivisible. No separate peace should be made when believers are fighting in the way of God. Conditions must be fair and equitable to all. So in other words, the Jewish community are part of the Ummah, they're part of the community, they're a separate part of it, but the same conditions apply to them. They also get protection. The Jews of the Banu are for one community with the believers. The Jews have their religion and the Muslims theirs. They're freedmen and their persons, except those who behave unjustly and sinfully, but they hurt only themselves and their families. The same had already been said further up about um, the, the people who uh, who seek spread in, to spread injustice or sin uh, within the Muslim part of the community are also, you know, they have to be punished. So it's the same conditions for the Jews as well. Um, where have we got to? The same applies to the Jews of the Banal Nanjo, Banal Harut, Banal Sadu, Banal Drusham. So there's either separate Jewish tribes or it's Jewish communities as associated with these tribes. Loyalty is protection against treachery. The freedmen of the Falaba are as themselves, yet another social group within Yathri. The close friends of the Jews are as themselves. None of them shall go out to war save with the permission of Muhammad, but he shall not be prevented from taking revenge for a wound. In other words, blood feud is going on still. That's not subject to Muhammad's decision, but group war, that's subject to Muhammad's decision. The Jews must bear their expenses and the Muslims their expenses. Each must help the other against anyone who attacks the people of this document. This is a remarkably, um, it's not, not quite liberal, but it's, it's quite an advanced document for the, for the um, seventh century. Uh, this is in the context of endless blood feuds and constant warring of, of, of tribal groups. And But here we have a, a, a super tribal group that has responsibilities and duties and privileges. The different parts owe it to each other and the same rules apply to all. So we can summarize the rights of non-Muslims from this document as, first of all, the security of God, the dhimma, the protection of God, is equal for all the different groups forming part of the Ummah. Non-Muslim members have equal political and cultural rights as Muslims and have autonomy and freedom of religion. Non-Muslims will take up arms when required to against the enemy of the Ummah and will able to share the cost of war. And there's to be no treachery between different groups within the Ummah. Uh, Non-Muslims will not be obliged to take part in religious wars with the Muslims. So if the Muslims attack people on religious grounds, that the Jews don't have to come along. It's only when someone comes along and attacks the whole thing. Okay, so this, this agreement worked fairly well for some time. Not everyone in Medina was convinced that Muhammad was a prophet at all. Certainly the Jews weren't, and there were pagans as well who weren't convinced. 
But the large population, which of course had been swelled by Muhammad's followers from Mecca, couldn't really be sustained by the very poor chances of local agriculture and resources were very, very scarce. So Muhammad uh, turned to a traditional situation, raiding outsiders, because that's what he did in Arabia. So since all the local tribes were covered by this constitution of Medina, it had been expanded to people outside the town, and they were a single ummah, you had to go outside that if you were going to raid. And the obvious target was the trading caravans of his original tribe, the Quraysh. And in normal circumstances, uh, Muhammad's tribal ties would have stopped him doing that. But let's face it, the Quraysh had thrown him out of Mecca, so I think he felt they were fair game. And in 624, Muhammad and his, fo his followers managed to capture a major caravan in what became known as the Battle of Badr. There's probably a couple of hundred people on each side of that. Uh, but the next year, they lost a similar battle, the Battle of Uhud, when the Quraysh sent a revenge raid from Mecca. Uh, and again, the tradition says 3,000 infantry and 200 cavalry, but it seemed terribly unlikely that um, societies this size could manage that many soldiers. But, but it may be just somewhat exaggerated the numbers. Luckily for Muhammad, the Meccans didn't press their advantage and uh, wipe his army out. They seemed to have been satisfied with the revenge raid and they went home. But two years later, they came back in 627 and they besieged Medina. This is known as the Battle of the Trench. Uh, Muhammad was warned that there's going to be an attack and he dug a trench around the entrances to the settlement to you know, keep the attackers out. And the siege was lifted after a few weeks and both sides claimed victory. So um, that's as far as we've got at the moment. I get to leave it there for the, our timeline because I want to finish off the life of Muhammad in the next uh, in the next part. But as you can see at this point, um, we've got a local religious leader who seems from the non-faith point of view to be drawing on religious ideas, uh, maybe some Jewish, maybe some Christian, maybe some local monotheists. Um, and again, from a non-faith point of view, weaving them together into a new form of a monothe monotheistic religion that incorporates older traditions and also has some uh, political vision in getting past this endless feuding tribal society and establishing a permanent constitution, a permanent agreement that's going to allow people to live together and is going to enable larger communities to develop and uh, is united against outsiders. So these are quite new and unusual things for this time and this place. Nothing quite like this had turned up. We said there was at least one other monotheistic prophet, but obviously he didn't succeed. Um, I'm not sure if his ideas were exactly the same or not, but uh, uh, maybe he didn't have the, the social ability, the social uh, wisdom that Muhammad seems to have dis displayed in creating a large community that could include people beyond his followers and actually use that extended community to entrench his own position and, and uh, spread his message. So at the moment we're seeing something that's very interesting developing a little bit unusual um, and I've, I've put in a timeline on this and you can I think you can download it from the Shul site I have a feeling and I've also put in a bit of a bibliography uh, Reuben Farstone's book that I've mentioned before is excellent and if you want uh, just a plain good introduction to Islam, there's a very nice one by David Brown that's um, very, very useful too. So I thought I'd leave uh, plenty of time for questions at this point because this is the first session and I'm uh, deluging you with a lot of new information. So do please, um, if you've got any questions, do do ask. Okay. So, so I just want to confirm one thing that, that fascinates me. Are you saying that just the majority of what we know about Muhammad, the all the story that you just told us about Muhammad is not in the Quran. It's from this, it's Haggai. It's Hag, whatever. It's, I, you know. it's, it's the Arabic form of Yitzchak. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah, but so it's, it's really, so the Quran doesn't talk much about Muhammad and doesn't give the, the origin story of Islam, no. right? No. Ah. no. It presents itself as being a record of what God told Muhammad. So it's divine revelation rather than history. And as I said, it only mentions Muhammad four times. Sometimes it says you, and traditional interpretation says, oh, this is where God is talking to Muhammad. But it doesn't mention him, doesn't really mention, it doesn't mention any of these battles, uh, or at least 
later interpretation might sometimes look at certain verses and say, that is talking about this battle. But if you only had the Quran, you would know next to nothing about Muhammad at all. Um, you just wouldn't have a framework to put it in, which is why um, Ibn Ishaq's Sirah, his biography, became so important because otherwise you really can't understand the Quran. Now, for mm. practicing Muslims, it's not a problem at all because they've grown up with all these stories. And uh, very much, you know, we, we, we've grown up with our ways of reading Torah. So where you, you probably had this where somebody says to you, well, uh, you know, why aren't you sacrificing anymore? And, you know, to a, to, a, to a modern Jew, that's a stupid question. It's like, well, we don't have temple. You know, why would we be sacrificing? But for somebody who only has the text, that's a reasonable question. Or they might say, uh, do you still do that thing about an eye for an eye? At which point any educated Jew will go, no, we never did that. It's monetary compensation. But, you know, who says it's monetary compensation? The rabbis tell us it's monetary compensation. They say that's the Torah Shabbat I'll pay. Torah doesn't say it. So most religions are composed of their sacred scripture plus a whole load of contextual stuff and interpretative stuff that they either regard as absolutely holy, as we do. We say Torah Shabbat I'll pay. You know, that's it, no question. Or it's just, uh, I would say that, that, that Ibn, Ibn Ishaq's biography is seen very much as we see Torah Shabbat al okay. No, it might not be in the Quran, but it doesn't mean it's not true. Of course it's true. You know, Ibn Ishaq had the Hadith. He had these sayings that were passed down to him. So of course it's true. So um, it doesn't make any sense if you talk to an, a religious Muslim to say, but there's no historical basis for all this story. It's only you know 150 years later in, a, in an edited biography that you have these stories. They're just going to say, well, what are you talking about? You know, I've known this all my life. Um, mm -hmm. So, but then it's true about us too. You know, and I don't know if you've ever had um, confrontations or, or conversations maybe with Christians who think that Jews are just the Old Testament quotation marks and nothing else and you know don't realize that we've done anything since so <laughs> it's quite difficult when you grow up in a religious culture because uh, you see your scripture as primary uh, primary but you don't realize that the way you see your scripture is the way you have uh, all through your life understood and learned to see that scripture and, and how to interpret it and how to view it and how to understand it so it's, we have to be a little bit you know <laughs> sensitive saying yeah other people are like us too in that way yeah um Eunice you've got a question Yes, um, if, if there were many people telling these stories, uh, would you not think that there would also be differences in the stories themselves and not any unanimity? Uh, that's possible. Um, as we don't know whether Ibn Ishaq edited, um, in other words, took some hadith as genuine and abandoned others as false. We just mm -hmm. don't know because uh, all we have is his version or the edited version of his version of here are the hadith that together give us a story. So if there were other traditions, they haven't been preserved and we don't know. So from this point of view, it looks very unitary. And it certainly does for believing Muslims. They go, well, Ibn Ishaq wrote it all down. You know, he was he was around pretty close to the time and he knew what was going on. And there were all these reliable traditions. So if there were alternate variations, they weren't preserved. And we just simply don't know. Another point is um, the Quran does refer to a lot of things from the Tanakh. It has the story of Joseph or an abbreviated form. It constantly refers to Moses. It refers to uh, all sorts of things we know from Tanakh, but in very piecemeal form. And it very, very often doesn't give the whole story. And it's a document that assumes you already know those stories. So, you know, I've asked Muslim friends of mine, why doesn't it give the story and say, well, you know, this is part three. You're meant to have read part one and part two. You're meant to know those stories from the scriptures that contain them. And not that all mo uh, modern Muslims are quite sometimes surprised to find that, you know, the rest of the story in the Torah, because uh, they don't, as general rule, uh, read Jewish or Christian scriptures. So sometimes they say, oh, that's why I never understood. Uh, but the Quran itself seems to assume that people do know these stories, which brings up the possibility that those stories were current in much of Arabian society, or certainly in Arabian urban society like Mecca, where there were a lot of Christians and Jews and people coming in and out and trading, what have you. And maybe by this time, because after all, we're talking sixth, seventh century, maybe these stories were very, very well known in an oral form. So I'm not saying that contemporary uh, Arabians have sat down and read the Torah, but maybe they knew stories about Abraham. And Muhammad knows that everyone knows stories about Abraham. So he doesn't have to tell them all over again because everyone knows his stories, so he can refer to them. 
in, in the Quran. Again, this is the outside faith view. Uh, the inner faith view would, would be, well, yes, you know, the, there are the previous scriptures, so they have all the details. And interestingly, in early Islam, there were uh, traditions known as Israeliyat, Israelite traditions, that were interpretive traditions that often added information about, say, Abraham and Isaac or what have you. Uh, later on, they not exactly fell into disrepute, but they were used less, but they were used a great deal in early Islam. And of course, some of the earliest converts to Islam were Jews, and they probably brought their knowledge in as well. And that probably helped the way this, this uh, close reliance on biblical stories uh, developed as well. So I think um, observant Muslims probably wouldn't deny that Muhammad had met Jews and Christians. Uh, they would deny that he heard their stories and then stuck them in the Quran. They would say these previous scriptural traditions existed, the knowledge was about, but God gave a new revelation uh, relying on the old ones to Muhammad um, and just expected Muhammad to have those earlier traditions. And we might see something, well, you could argue from an academic point of view, you can say something, see something similar in, uh, in Tanakh in certain things like the Leviathan and various creation myths that appear here and there in Job and uh, Eov and in Isaiah and elsewhere and some of the um, most uh, the poetic parts of the Bible. Uh, again, academically, they're often understood as older Canaanite epics that were incorporated to Tanakh. Um, from Jews don't say it that way. So again, it's a, it depends on you looking from the inside, you're looking from the outside. So I hope that helps a bit. Are there any any other questions at all? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know if I'm going on a different, the, the question will send to a different tangent, but um, the Muslims believe, or the Arab believes that they're descended of Ismail. And then there's Ishaq, Yaakov, David, uh, Moshe, why do they even care about those prophets? And what is it exactly that, why is there, why is, why is there conflict between the Jews that it consider that we're descended from all those prophets? What do they believe that Isma, with the, the story after Ismail? Uh, could you clear out the confusion in terms of Ismail, Yitzhak Yaakov and their lin, legacy? Well, I can, I can try them? a bit. I can okay. try a bit. Well, Both, at least what they believe. Okay. Um, well, again, not all Muslims believe exactly the same thing, rather like not all Jews believe exactly the same thing. Um, because many of the stories figure in the Quran, it's obvious to Muslims that these are all very holy people and that they're prophets and that they are figures worthy of knowing about and that they are bearers of this <coughs> original monotheism, uh, which sort of every now and then precipitates out in a scripture. So it precipitates out in the Torah, you know, God reveals this version, then he reveals the New Testament for Christians, then he reveals the Quran, which is consent for, by Muslim, for Muslims, that's the last and the best one, you know, it's volume three in it. In, well, it, it sort of rests on one and two, but you don't need one and two because it's all in volume three. Um, so anyone who appears in the Quran as a prophet is going to be very, very important. The whole Ishmael um, Isaac thing has been complicated by later interpretation. Uh, the story of the Akeda appears in the Quran, but the son is not named. It doesn't actually say in the Quran which son it was that Abraham almost sacrifices. Early Muslim commentary often thought it was Isaac. Later Muslim commentary tended to think it was Ishmael. And if you ask the Muslim in the streets, they'll say, well, it was, it was Ishmael, Ishmael. Of course it was Ishmael. The Quran says so. And then you go back to the Quran and go, actually, it doesn't. Um, so part of this uh, emphasis on Ishmael is, is the result of later interpretation. I'm not even sure that the Quran actually says that, um, that all the Arabs are descended from Ishmael. But as he becomes more important by means of interpretation, then there's a natural tendency to say, well, we are his descendants. And there's also a natural tendency, if you've got really holy people, you want to write them into your story. So, for instance, uh, Muslims believe that the Kaaba was set up by Abraham. Um, and it's the original holy house. And it's the product of Abraham. And, you know, the idols were destroyed by Abraham. Well, that were destroyed by Muhammad and his followers, but there had been no idols in there at the time of Abraham. Uh, so again, 
uh, the story of Hagar comes in the Quran or references to it, and the Hagar seeking water sort of happened at Mecca. So what you, talking about purely academically, if you are religion three of a monotheistic set, number two, we all know builds in number one, okay? If you're number three, how do you incorporate number one and two? You don't want to say they're false because they all worship one God and so do you. You do want to say, I lay claim to one and two's traditions, but mine is the fulfillment of the best thing. And that's really what Islam did. So it built on and incorporated in, um, academically speaking, again, uh, Muslims wouldn't accept what I'm saying now, uh, but if, from our point of view, it built in versions one and two so that they can then be seen as reinforcing and grounding super deluxe version number three. So you can't afford to chuck it out. Say the Christians had the same problem. They couldn't chuck out the Old Testament because uh, the whole story of Jesus relies on it. You know, if you haven't got a Messiah concept, then Jesus isn't very important, is he? Uh, and the Old Testament was seen as the precursor again, as volume one to the even better volume two. Uh, Jews don't have this problem because we're number one <laughs> in chronological terms. We haven't got to incorporate people who come after us. It's like, you know, well, why do we care about Jesus? He's nothing to us. <laughs> Whereas for Christians, it's terribly important to incorporate David and all the rest of it, because that's a real scripture from God. And for Muslims, it's terribly important to incorporate uh, first monotheism, second monotheism, because there's a third. So in a way, that's why, uh, they, that's why, the, for, again, from an academic outside point of view, that is why the Quran is very interested in biblical stories and, and makes use of them and weaves them into this perfect monotheism that has always existed and has gone up and down in its fortunes, but Muhammad has come to clear things up finally for everybody, so everyone knows how they should be worshiping God. Does that help? Not hundred percent, but it, it, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> maybe it'll become clearer as we go on. Maybe, you know, I, 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 because the, I, because the, the, the the challenge is that yes, no, you made it very clear that they needed to integrate it. Mike, the, the, they had no choice. Right, well, Christians. It's in their holy book. What are they going to do with it? You know? but, but Christians did a very smooth job into Jesus from Old Testament to New Testament. Right, the Quran doesn't seem, and and I'm and I'm I'm very interested to hear more. But the Quran doesn't seem to have this smooth ride. There is this Abraham, Jacob, Moses, all Jews, 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 Jews. Right, and important. Suddenly, Jews are not really important, and so. Um, and Muslims, as as we know, um, are 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 the key component. So yeah, you also have to remember that Muslims don't really see Abraham and and Isaac as Jewish. They see them as monotheists, as Hanif. How's it they possible? They know they're written about in the Torah. I understand, but... I, I understand Abraham. That I understand. Yeah. Abraham is the father of all religions, yeah. but. Isaac and Moses are clearly. By the time you get to Moses, there's Bani Israel, as the children of Israel, yes, and and the, the tribes, yeah. But, but certainly Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I think they would think of them as monotheists rather than as Jewish. I mean, technically they aren't Jewish. Jewish is a term invented from the uh, that applies to Judean people, the... but they exactly. do consider them so, you know, Israelite, Israelite or Hebrews. Israelite or Hebrews. I'm going to gonna suggest, Sharon, that we are one class in. We have a nine class series. Sure. We're so <laughs> fortunate. And I, I just want to uh, to thank you, Rabbi Dr. Lindsay, for your scholarship and your breadth, because it is one thing to receive a program guide. It's another thing entirely to be able to listen to you. And um, it's, it's a stunning breadth of knowledge that you have. And we are so, so appreciative for this first class. And I want to say thank you. Everybody, I'm sure you'll agree with me that uh, we're in the presence of a real scholar. And if you enjoyed today, we invite you to return next Monday as we'll be continuing with class two. Uh, class two's topic is going to be Muhammad's later life to the early spread of Islam. And uh, we'll be at the same time and it'll be the same link. I will send out a reminder link uh, once again next Monday.